Ready? So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Carolyn Beck from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she did her PhD at Caltech. She's won a number of awards since then, um, NSF Career Award, I think a Young Investigator Award from ONR, but recently elevated as an IEEE Fellow this year, so that's very prestigious. And she's done some great work. I kind of most of the work I initially saw of hers was in the model reduction area. And she's been working on various network. And I think she's going to tell us about some of that today. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Pete, for the invitation. It's really nice to be here. I've told a number of you that I met with it. It's my first time at the University of Michigan, which is a little bit crazy because I'm not really that far away. But it's really nice to be here and finally um, see the campus. Um, so today we'll be looking at uh, a few different models um, for um, capturing the dynamics of epidemic processes, and um, we'll look both at um, equilibrium analysis and stability analysis of those equilibria, and, um, and we'll look at in the case where these processes are evolving over network structures, so we might have network structures arising from, say, human contact networks or transportation networks or any number of different levels of networks, um, how that affects the analysis and, um, and how it changes, model, changes the models. Okay. So many computers up here. I have to... um, so the mathematical modeling of infectious diseases certainly isn't new. Um, the earliest paper that I'm aware of on the topic was published in 1760 by Daniel Bernoulli of the famous Bernoulli, Bernoulli mathematician family, right? I can get a brother and a father. So I'm sure you've seen the name in some incarnation somewhere. Um, I like Daniel Bernoulli because really he was a decision and control theorist. I think he worked on um, topics that uh, I think we would all say are sort of decision and control theoretic. Um, but he proposed what we call an SRI type model for smallpox. Do people know what I mean when I say SIR? Susceptible infected recovered. I'm gonna talk about it, but um, <clears throat> to some extent, I, I think a lot of people know a lot more about infectious diseases than when I first started working on this topic in 2015. So I'm sorry if I'm telling you things you know, and if I'm leaving out things that you don't know because you haven't paid that much attention to modeling, um, stop me and let me know. Um, so as you can see, so as I said, he proposed an SRI type model for small tox and it, a smallpox, and if you can read the French or recognize the cognates, you can see that he was a proponent of vaccinations. Um, so he was trying to convince people to get vaccines for smallpox, which they had in 1760 in Europe. They actually had in China in about the year 1000, which I only learned when I started studying this. I thought it was pretty amazing, actually. Um, <clears throat> So over the last um, two decades, there's been uh, more focus on um, the study of epidemics evolving over networks. And um, so we will typically assume that we have some given underlying network structure. Um, so this can ri arise at uh, different levels of granularity. So it, it may be down to what I would consider the finest level of granularity when we're talking about infectious diseases, and that is viewing um, individuals um, and since we're talking about networks, in this case, the individuals would be the nodes. Um, but uh, we might look at those models as controls people, but actually epidemiologists, <laughs> that would be a little too fine for them. So they um, tend to look at uh, aggregated population groups. So this, the population groups might be aggregated like on a neighborhood level or a city level or even a state or country level. And with some of my um, undergrads, we looked at some models for Champaign County based on neighborhoods. So um, that's sort of typically the finest uh, level of granularity we look at in terms of sort of epidemiological studies. Um, so our motivation then is um, understanding, predicting, and controlling these ep epidemic process dynamics. And so we really want to understand sort of quantitatively what role network structure plays. Um, so in particular, we might have some fixed structure that we know something about, or we might just say, maybe we just know something about the sparsity of the network. Um, and so what we're trying to understand is, can we say something quantitative like um, we can look at some function of, say, the adjacency matrix of the um, network structure, and we can relate that to, say, some function of the disease model parameters, and we can use sort of this comparative information to inform us in terms of making policies. So, for example, like quarantine policies. 
Right. And so that's really our goal. We're trying to sort of come up with some sort of understanding uh, in a quantitative le level. Um, as well, during the recent pandemic, obviously there was a lot of um, sort of acknowledgement and concern about the role that the asymptomatic play in um, disease transmission and the spread of disease processes. So we've also, um, at during COVID, took a more active uh, part in looking at the role that um, the asymptomatic proportion of the population plays. And it's not that um, epidemiologists or virologists, I guess, maybe didn't know that asymptomatic people or pre-symptomatic people might sometimes be infectious. But with COVID, actually, it was just that there was such a significant portion of the population that was asymptomatic and stayed asymptomatic, but was still infectious at the same time. So, so this came to play a bigger role. So we'll talk a little bit about this as well in the talk in terms of the models. Um, as well, there are many other types of um, networked contagion processes we can talk about uh, in addition to infectious diseases. Obviously, we can look at misinformation or rumors over social networks. So this is a picture of a, a Twitter diffusion network. Um, uh, we can look at the um, progression of systemic risk in financial markets or financial networks. Obviously, this is pretty timely right now. I'm afraid I don't know very much about finance or else I'd probably be trying to understand this. This picture even has a credit Swiss note in it. So uh, so we understand that there, there, there are papers actually called like contagion in financial markets. Um, that use some of this model similar to what we'll be talking about. So um, most of my talk, I'm gonna focus on human diseases, infectious diseases, um, and the terminology will be uh, more connected to that type of process, but pretty much what everything we're talking about has some um, bearing on some of these other types of epidemic examples. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief overview of some common epidemiological models. So these are the compartment models um, and, and provide a little notation. So that's part that I'm thinking maybe some of you have probably seen. And then we'll look at how um, some of the, these structures, these model structures extend to network versions. And um, so we'll look at some connections between there's varying levels of models. So we'll look at some connections between some of these models to serve as background. And then we'll look at a control theoretic analysis, as I said, of the, um, the equilibria and convergence or not convergence to these equilibria for these, for these models, as we'll see, basically nonlinear models. And then um, depending on how much time we have, we'll go into a little more detail talking about what if the networks are time varying or we have multivirus uh, processes over multilayer networks. So uh, what's a multi-layer network? In particular, the financial market networks are typically viewed as being multi-layer. So that's an example where that might be applicable. And then I'll um, conclude with maybe sort of reviewing the open problems in the area. Um, okay, so before I discuss specific models, um, I'd like to note that there are basically two classes of models for epidemics, and you may have heard of both of them. Um, but we essentially have stochastic models, most commonly um, uh, the stochastic dynamics are modeled using Markov, process, Markov processes. Um, in this case, we assume each of our N nodes can be in one of M disease states. So a disease state being, you know, you're healthy, you're infected, maybe you're recovered and immune. There may be other disease states that are asymptomatic, for example. Um, and then the transition between these states is guided by a transition, uh, like a transition matrix. It's probabilistic. But um, as you, if you've had Markov processes, you know the dimension of that model is then going to be M to the N, right? The number of states and the number of nodes. So those are intractable. So people have focused, uh, in terms of epidemiological studies, more on the deterministic models. So these would be our compartment models or uh, in the network case, a mean field approximation models. And these are typically deterministic differential equations. And so we'll take a look at those as well. And then the network models, um, we're just looking at either the Markov models or the mean field models with an explicit network structure included. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the basic or the classic 
what we call epidemiological models and compartment models. Okay, so the simplest models and what we call an SIS model. In this model, everyone in the population is either considered susceptible or healthy or infected. So we're gonna break the whole population up into two groups. Um, and then the healthy people or the susceptible, they become infected at some rate beta when they come in contact with infected people. Um, and the infected people, they become healthy again at some rate delta. So in this model, once you become infected, you have no immunity. You're transitioning immediately back to the susceptible state. Um, so the actual mathematical model that captures this process is just a pair of differential equations. So we basically have a differential equation for each compartment um, that captures the rate of change of the proportion of the population, in this case, that's infected and the proportion of the population that's susceptible. Um, and you might note that um, if you added these two equations, you get zero. Basically, these are proportions of the population. We assume that they satisfy a mass balance equation. So at any given time t, the proportion of the population that's in the infected compartment plus the proportion of the population susceptible compartment is equal to one. And this will be true of all the compartment models we look at. We always assume that these mass balance equations hold. Um, and um, this is also not a new model. This was uh, this particular form of the model was proposed about 100 years ago. And people often refer to this as a Kermack the Kendrick model. And that's also true for this model, the SIRS model. Um, this is also a Kermack the Kendrick model in this form that's um, proposed. Um, so this model is a little bit more appropriate for viruses. Okay. Um, here, everyone is either susceptible infected or recovered. And when they're in the recovered compartment uh, or group, we're assuming they have some immunity. If the immunity is permanent, they stay there. If the immunity is not permanent, they return transition back to the susceptible compartment at some rate delta, okay? Um, so we have three compartments. We have three differential equations. These are like mildly nonlinear, I guess, uh, bilinear differential equations. Um, again, they satisfy the mass balance equations. Um, a, a very straightforward extension of the SIRS model is the SEIRS model. And this model just adds an extra compartment to capture incubation time. And here, classically, people assume that you're susceptible, you're exposed, you, you come into contact with infected people, you become exposed, but you're not contagious. And then with some rate sigma, you, tran you transition to that uh, infectious symptomatic function. Another um, extension of the SIRS model is the SAIRS model. So this was the model I said during COVID, a lot of people were looking at this type of model to try to capture you know, COVID dynamics because it became apparent pretty early on that the asymptomatic proportion of the population was playing a role in disease spread. So this particular structure is the one that, that we proposed in my group. Um, so there's variations now in terms of what transitions to what uh, exactly how. So, so the way we looked at it, we said, okay, you can be susceptible, you come into contact uh, with infected people, then you might become either um, asymptomatic or symptomatic. The, the proportion of the group that becomes asymptomatic, we denote by Q, so one minus Q becomes symptomatic. So we're assuming a pretty quick incubation period for those that become symptomatic. Um, and then if you're asymptomatic, you may then transition to the uh, symptomatic infected, so at a rate sigma, so just like in the SEIR model. <laughs> but what we saw with COVID is some people were asymptomatic the whole time, so then they transition to the recovered state. Um, so again, we have four compartments. We have four differential equations. Um, they satisfy the mass balance equations again. So at any time, S plus A plus I plus R is going to be equal to one. And the sum of the first order derivatives will be zero. Um, so we've gone from, say, a simple two compartment, two differential e equation, two parameter model with the SIS. Um, to the SIRS, which is three differential equations, three parameters, uh, to adding one more compartment. But now we have, we only have four differential equations, but we have, I don't know, something like six parameters. Um, 
And so this might not really capture everything exactly. There are people that proposed a nine compartment model for COVID during the um, pandemic. But the problem is if you're trying to like use data uh, to estimate the parameters and predict uh, the epidemic processes, um, the data is not sufficiently informative to actually even to um, estimate six parameters. The data wasn't sufficiently informative, right? So, so there's a trade-off between really sort of getting a model that really captures the dynamics and getting a model that you can use um, to estimate things and, and maybe do some quick predictions in, in a short time frame. Um, okay, so uh, what I wanna look at here is how these models come about. Okay, we just said basically they're proposed. Here's a couple of differential equations. I think it captures the dynamics of disease spread. And we can start um, by looking at the Markov models. So um, the Markov models, let's focus on the SIS. So there's just two states, makes it a little simpler. So, in, in, so if you have a population of N individuals, I'm gonna assume they're individuals, but it could be, as I said, subgroups in the population. We assume each node is either infected or susceptible in the, um, so that's each person, right? You take a test, you're negative, <laughs> take a test, you're positive, right? Um, and then as an individual, you transition between these two states based on these disease parameter values, the infection rate and the recovery rate, beta and delta. Um, and so if we want to understand the, the progression of the disease in the entire population, we'd form a string, it'd be really long, right, of all individuals and what their state is at any time t, right? And then evaluating the progression of that would then be done by considering um, the Markov process, basically acting on the probability of being in any of the states, and so that would give us a Markov chain with two to the n states. So if we have n equals three, it's pretty simple to see. These are all the possible states the population of three can be in. And then we look at, you know, what are the probabilities of transitioning between these states? And that would be based on basically the beta and delta values, right? Okay, so that's unwieldy, right? Any real population size n, two to the n gets too big, too fast. So what most epidemiologists started by doing was saying, let's look at the, what they call the population dynamics instead. So rather than looking at, you know, the particular states in the chain, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Instead, they said, let's just count the number of infected and count the number of uh, susceptible and look at how those counts evolve, right? And so going back to, you know, what we understand about the probabilities of transition, we can say, okay, and so by that's the number of infected, we know it's gonna transition, it's gonna increase with some probability proportional to beta, the infection rate parameter, um, times the number of infected and susceptible you already have, right? And, and the amount of time that you're letting elapse. Um, it's gonna decrease with some probability proportion to the recovery rate, the delta, and the number of infected that you're starting with, right? It's gonna, um, stay the same with probability one minus those things, right? We have, um, and then the number of susceptible is just gonna be N minus the number of infected. So I'm assuming the population size stays constant here. So we're essentially making an underlying assumption that um, the, the disease dynamics are evolving at a rate faster than birth and death processes. Um, okay, so then um, if you let N get very large, and you let delta t go to zero, you can apply Kurtz's theorem. Is anyone familiar with Kurtz's theorem? Okay, basically Kurtz's theorem, maybe you are, <laughs> is just a law of large numbers for Markov models. It's like a central limit theorem for Markov models, okay? And so we just apply Kurtz's theorem, and what we get then, if we consider the proportions of the population, as we did before, the proportions, is we actually get the kermack mckendrick model from these, what we call these population dynamics in the limit. Okay, so, so that's nice. There's a justification. We go from what people consider to be somewhat precise Markov model to these nice compartment models um, applying the theory. And um, it's interesting because this model, these models were proposed in 1927 and Kurtz's theorem was published in something like 1981. So <laughs> it was justified retroactively, I guess. But now this is what people look at. 
Okay, and there's been piles of work on compartment modeling. This is a I could probably have hundreds of pages like this. Um, so I haven't really done it justice, but you know, there's a lot more out there. Um, okay, so what about when we have networks? Um, okay, so why do we care about the networks? Why don't we just use the compartment models? The compartment models assume everyone is mixing with everyone else equally all the time. So if we said we want to understand what the underlying um, contact network is in a compartment model, it would be a complete graph. It would mean family A and family B are interacting with each other as much as they are amongst themselves, right? So um, clearly this is then over predicting disease spread. And this became apparent to epidemiologists with SARS in the early 2000s. Um, but it also became uh, uh, on a separate track, people started looking at networked epidemic processes from the um, perspective of communication and computer networks as well. So about the same time, so in the early 2000s, people started taking into account network structure. So not only for computer viruses, but also for um, human um, diseases. Okay, so what we do instead is we say, okay, we're gonna assume that the underlying topology of the contact network, for now we're gonna assume it's arbitrary. When I say it's arbitrary, it means it's not a line, it's not a circle, it's not a uh, hub and spoke. We don't know the structure. We just have some underlying structure. Um, we're gonna capture the structure, um, assuming it's some weighted graph structure by um, defining that by the adjacency matrix of the structure W, okay? So W tells us the strength of interconnection between each it's a pair of nodes. So it's pairwise interconnection strength. So this would be the strength of the interconnection from node one to node two, for example. Okay. And um, we're not just assuming ones and zeros, not are they connected or not. Here we're assuming that there's weaker and stronger. So here are my little pictures meant to be that the darker edges would be larger values of the WIJs and the little lighter ones would be smaller values. And if there's no connection, it's zero. Um, but we do assume that these are always non negative. So we don't have negative interconnections. Okay, so, um, so now let's look at, for the network case, what the Markov model would look like, okay? So here we would have, say, n nodes, so we have 11, um, and um, they're all in some initial disease state, and they're interacting with each other with respect to the structure, and so they're going to transition um, between the uh, susceptible and infected and infected and susceptible based again on the disease parameters, but also we're going to take into account the network structure explicitly. So if you're healthy and you're interacting strongly with your sick neighbors, right, then your um, probability or rate of transitioning to infected is going to be a little bit higher than if, you know, you're weakly connected to only healthy people. Right, so we've dropped the interacting with everyone equally and we're explicitly taking into account the network structure in the transitions really from healthy to, to infected. Um, if you're susceptible, you're still gonna um, recover at a rate. And so we would expect to see that um, the disease would spread uh, first to the nodes where most strongly interconnected to like that, right? Okay, so then again, we go back to how do we describe the full state? Full state again, we would make a big string of all the states and uh, all the nodes and their states, right? So for this 11th node graph, um, we'd have 2,048 states, <laughs> possible states, right? That describe the dynamics uh, or that describe the, the progression from one state to the next. Um, and then again, we have a Markov process where we're really looking at what, we have a big vector of 2,048 entries that tells us what's the probability of being in any state K at any time T, right? The usual Markov process model. And then this would evolve um, relative to, you know, the, what we consider to be the probability transition matrix in the, uh, in the Markov chain or the infinitesimal generator in the continuous Markov process case. 
And so the entries of this infinitesimal generator, they're determined by the, the beta, the delta, and the interconnection strings, the Ws, okay? and some indexing issues. Okay? So this gives us a two to the n state networked stochastic model capturing the, the progression of the disease. And people often refer to this as the exact to the end state. So this is, this is considered the most sort of a true model. How, how much it is, you know, that's relative to how much faith you have in your disease parameter values and such. Okay, of course, this is unwieldy. As soon as, I mean, this is N is 11, and now we already have a dimension model 2048, right? So what people use instead, um, widely widely at this point um so this uh, a lot of the analysis of this was done probably about 15 starting about 15 years ago um is something called the mean field approximation model i'm going to show a quick derivation of this too um so here for the sis model we just need one differential equation representing what we call the probability that node i is infected okay um and so that's the form of the model so now we're going to use p sub i of t to represent the probability that node i is infected at time t and one minus p then represents the probability that um, node i is healthy. Okay, so this is for the SIS model. So, so how do we get there from the Markov model? It's sort of like the same type of argument as we did before, right? We're going to say let's look at all the possible transition probabilities. So. We, we know the condition of the entire population at time t, x of t, the state we're in. Um, so given what we know about the interconnection structure and the disease parameters, then we can compute what's the probability that node i transitions from the healthy state to the infected state, right? Given the condition at time t over some time interval delta t. And that's, again, dependent on proportional equal to the infection rate and then basically how strongly connected we are to infected neighbors. Right? And then, of course, we can look at all the other probabilities. The probability that we're infected and we transition to the healthy state, it's going to be dependent on delta. We have probabilities of being infected and staying infected, being healthy and staying inf healthy, right? take all these probabilities, we apply the total law of uh, probability. So sum them up, we let the delta T go to zero and we take expectations. And we get this nice differential equation of the expectation that node I is infected. Um, and this is what we call the exact expectation dynamics. So we're almost to the mean field model, but we have this uh, covariance term. <laughs> We didn't see before. Um, so uh, using the usual identity, the probability of an event Z is equal to the expectation of its uh, indicator function, we can directly write uh, an equivalent sort of uh, differential equation for the probability that node I is infected from our exact expectation dynamics. And now my covariance becomes a joint probability, right? So the CIJ term here, is the probability that uh, the joint probability that node I and node J, assuming they're neighbors, are both infected. And he, the approximation in the mean field approximation is simply making the assumption to simplify things that, that these are independent so we can take this as a product of the probabilities. This is clearly not true, right? I mean, if we are strongly connected to, if I'm I and I'm strongly connected to J, the probability of me being infected and J being infected is clearly not, these are not independent. That's the assumption that's made. And so um, with that assumption, we get that mean field approximation model for uh, the differential equation describing the probability that node I is infected, taking into account the um, interconnection structure. And you can see if you take this equation and go back and look at the kermack mckendrick model, it looks very similar, right? We have this is uh, I of T, this is S of T. Sorry, I got that backwards. This is I of T, this is S of T, right? We have beta here, um, this is the delta I of T. So we have the same form, uh, 
but now it's on a node by node structure. Okay, so in this case, using the mean field approximation, which is actually going to upper bound the true probability of being infected because of that approximation we've made, um, we can go from a model of dimension two to the n for the SIS model to a model of dimension n. Okay, so we'll have one of these for each of the nodes. So this is again for the SIS model. If we had the SIR model, we would have two equations. So in the compartment models, we started with two differential equations, but because of that mass balance law, we really only have to look at one. So that's why we're going SIS model, there were two different equations. Now there's just one SIRS, there were three equations. Then I'm saying we're going to two, et cetera. Okay, so because of the mass balance equation, we have an algebraic constraint that allows us to draw. Okay, so this is a model that you see the most when people talk about epidemic processes over networks. Okay, so what does it look like for the SAIRS model? So now we're starting with the four different equations. We go through the process that we just went through, right? This would get lead to a Markov model of dimension four to the n, right? Um, going through all the same steps, what we do is we then apply the mass balance equation and we look at the probability of being asymptomatically infected, the probability of being symptomatically infected. So that's my P is always symptomatically infected and the probability of being recovered um, at any time T. And we can go through the same steps and, and come up with these differential equations. So in this case, the Markov process model will be dimension four to the N. The, the mean field approximation model is dimension three N. Okay, so we had a big savings in model or model order. So this is where my model reduction still, <laughs> philosophy still appeals to me. Um, okay. Okay, so I just did a whole bunch of modeling of epidemic processes in, I don't know, I guess 30 minutes, that was pretty long. Any questions? Okay, a lot of work again over epidemics over networks. So let's look at the analysis of equilibrium stability. Just one quick question. Yep. You mentioned like fitting the parameters. You <laughs> like, how do, like you don't get to measure everything. So how do you decide to fit all the parameters and what data do people actually use? Yeah, it's like a whole nother um, talk. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we'll digress a little later. Um, so let's say with COVID. Okay, we're doing these um, tests for COVID, right? And so you think, maybe I should go get a COVID test. I'm gonna take a test, I'm infected or I'm not. That seems to be the information we have. Some places ask people more questions. Have you been having symptoms, right? Um, but for the most part, we had infected or not, and we had a progression of those numbers, <laughs> right, over time. Um, and that's not a random sample. Unless we test everyone, thank you, Iceland. They tested everyone over some period of time. There were some other countries, maybe Slovakia or something like that, right? We don't have random sample data. So estimating data, you do it, but you know, like the usual statistical estimation requirements don't hold, right? So, um, so for people like us who, you know, we know regression techniques and all that, but we're not satisfying the assumptions. So we used a combination of different data sets that had varying levels of, I guess, some completely not random, complete convenient sample, right? Um, some a little more random or they test the whole country um, versus um, looking at what the virologists and immunologists were coming up with by actually doing sort of more biological analysis of it. So it's a little bit of a hack to fit the parameters, but you just can only do what you do. At some point, given enough time, we know what the parameter values are of diseases. With COVID, it keeps changing, right? The, mut the mutations, right? The, in, the beta has been um, essentially, we're getting more and more transmissibility, uh, it seems, with the mutations. I think maybe we're slowing down, right? So. That's another thing. Okay, stability analysis. I should go pretty quick through this. So this is basic calculus, right? And this is a classic 
1927 analysis, right? We have a compartment model. We have a, a set of differential equations. Um, because they satisfy the mass balance action laws, you can, it's easy to show that if your proportions start anywhere in the interval between zero and one, they will always stay there. So we have some proportion, some initial proportion of susceptible, infected, and, and recovered. We want to drive this to the disease-free state. That means we want I dot to be negative. We can just, as I said, do the simple calculus analysis to show what we need to get that. And so, as I showed in 1957, doing something like this, you just need that the rate of infection over the rate of um, recovery should be less than one. It makes sense, doesn't it? We're all recovering faster than we're getting infected again. At some point, the infection will die out. And this is what's known as the basic reproduction number. So people seen this a lot over the last three years, right? Basic reproduction number, blah, blah, blah. R not needs to be less than one. Okay, that's pretty basic. Sure. Yep. This is a really simple question, but the population is one, right? Everything happens. Yeah, we're seeing, yeah. So what does stability mean in that sense? Stability means that we eradicate the disease for this particular disease-free equilibrium. So, so it's a convergence. So stability is really convergence, but you know, I'm a control person, so I call it something that we're really talking about convergence analysis. Yeah. There's nothing going off to infinity and an instability. Nothing really goes to, yeah, but it doesn't go away. And um, so we'll get there in a minute. So yeah, so we have, so we have two possible equilibrium. So this is the one we typically want. Um, so this, using this, these methods, we get basically a global asymptotic stability result. Take out your Khalil book. You can show that for the same condition, <laughs> you can get an exponential stability result. So that also matters. We would rather get exponential stability results, right? You'd rather get rid of this disease faster than wait for time to go to infinity, right? Okay, so those are also concerns in this analysis. Um, we don't always <laughs> have the condition we need to converge to the disease-free equilibrium. If this ratio is greater than one, we either have to try to do something to change these numbers to make it less than one, treatments, vaccinations, et cetera, or we have to accept that we're gonna to converge to an endemic equilibrium. So you can set S dot I dot and R dot equal to zero, do the algebra and solve for this equilibrium point. Um, you might think this looks bad, but wait till you see for the SARES model. <laughs> um, note that these values are, are completely dependent on the disease parameter values, right? So the uh, infection rate, recovery rate, and the return, the delta, which determines the duration of immunity. If delta is zero, right? This goes to the disease-free state always. The problem is, it might be that this is really high and you know maybe a lot of people died on the way. So that's the problem with the herd immunity argument, right? Because you don't know what the collateral is in luck. Okay, yep. Is this equilibrium stable or unstable? So this is, a, is actually a, a stable equilibrium. Yeah. Exponentially? Hmm? Exponentially stable? I'm um, trying to remember, I didn't do these results. I think, I don't, I don't remember actually. Yeah, it, they definitely look slower than the, when you do the simulations anyway. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't say. Um, for the networked SIRS, okay, this is a little more recent then, okay, last five to 10 years. Um, so we have the two, with three compartments, we have the two differential equations for the infected and recovered. Um, oh, I should also note too, in this case, I'm allowing, if I assume that the nodes are subpopulations, they might have different, slightly different betas, deltas, and gammas, right? The disease parameters that present, that might seem weird, but the disease parameters that present in a nursing home might be different than the disease parameters that present in a kindergarten, as an extreme example. Okay, so, so we're allowing for what we call heterogeneous, uh, often allowing for heterogeneous mm, parameter values in the network case, just so we can generalize to the case of these nodes being subpopulation groups and the demographics being possibly different. 
Okay, so we can work through uh, an analysis again. Um, so this has been done, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but what's interesting is what we see is um, we end up with a condition, as I said, in terms of our, that we wanted in terms of our adjacency matrix. And that is that if the maximum real part of the eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix W is less than the ratio of the recovery to infection rate, then we'll satisfy the conditions for um, convergence <laughs> to the disease-free equilibrium. Okay, so what do we have here actually? We have some function of the adjacency matrix given in a relation to some function of the disease parameters. That's what we were hoping for at the beginning, right? So this one's pretty nice and straightforward. And you might actually note, hmm, that looks, that gamma over beta, that's just one over R naught. So we could actually say, if we scale, so this would be the worst case R naught, if we had a heterogeneous uh, dynamics in our subgroups. If we scale our basic reproduction number by the maximum eigenvalue of our adjacency matrix, right? We now come up with sort of an effective reproduction number for the disease. Um, and if we satisfy this condition over the networked population, we'll converge to the uh, disease-free equilibrium. Okay, so that's pretty simple. And I said this is a little more recent. Um, and typically the networks, the adjacency matrices have uh, maximum eigenvalues lesser than or equal to one. The real part, we're talking about the real part of these. Huh? Um, so let's look at SARES in this context, right? Um, so we'll look at the compartment model and then we'll look at the network version and what it looks like when we increase the um, complexity of our model by one compartment and a few more parameters. Okay, so this is what the disease-free equilibrium state looks like, right? This would give us all the derivatives are equal to zero, okay? Um, so if we, we can, we can take two approaches. We can um, look at, um, do a, an analysis of the Jacobian. So again, we're using the classic nonlinear uh, analysis techniques, right? And do an eigenvalue analysis, or we can use a Lyapunov analysis. So if you just open chapter four of Khalil and go through the theorems, <laughs> right? Um, we know um, if, if all the eigenvalues of this Jacobian, so this is the, the three state equations, we've made the substitution for the mass balance law. So we are looking at A, I, and R equations. We um, compute these values at the equilibrium. Right, we look at the eigenvalues. If they're all less than zero, then we know we have convergence to that equilibrium point, right? So doing that, we get um, the condition, the first condition is delta has to be positive, which we assume all the disease parameters are always um, non-negative. Okay? Um, and then the second is that the max of these two quantities has to be upper bounded by one. So that becomes the effective um, basic reproduction number for the SARS model. Um, so again, we basically have this beta over gamma type of um, ratio plus the other transitions, you know, from asymptomatic and then also based on um, uh, asymptomatic to infected and asymptomatic to recovered. And this will give us a, this gives us a global, using eigenvalue analysis, a global uh, asymptotic stability condition. We can use Lyapunov analysis to get an exponential stability condition. Okay. okay. Um, what does the endemic equilibrium look like? Yuck. <laughs> Thankfully, we have symbolic MATLAB, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I find it a little astounding that we went from this three compartment model that had a, a fairly clear endemic equilibrium to this four compartment model. And now I think it's really a mess. But again, note the infected. Um, a and I are the infected groups. They're directly proportional to delta, which is that uh, tells us how long our immunity is, right? If delta zero, we have permanent immunity. These will go to zero. It's just that these values 
in particular, the percentage or the proportion of recovered might be kind of high. Same thing that we saw before. Okay, and here's just a few um, simulations where we looked at changing the delta values, but we looked um, what I call data informed models based on COVID data. So that means using some of the data and using some of the literature to, to estimate these models. Um, so this is the initial COVID uh, parameters. Um, so if our immunity was really short, we would um, settle at a pretty high percentage over 30% of the population always be infected. <laughs> um, if it's a little longer, so now like three months, we'd settle it. Um, if you add these two, you get the asymptomatic and the symptomatic, right? So here we're at, you know, this is more like, um, so these are proportions of the population. So um, more like, I don't know, 7%, I guess. And so this is a 500 days out. We did a simulation using the most recent data we had for the Omicron variant. So now it's a lot more transmissible. Um, and we assumed an immunity of about 200 days. It's a little bit long, that's like six months. But we also assumed part of that was due to assuming we had yearly boosters. You can kind of see where the boosters are given. So this is a five year window, um, yearly boosters. And we assume 70% of the population is uh, accepting these, which is probably a lot higher than we'd actually see. And then you can see that um, uh, if we assume a compartment model, uh, clearly COVID is going to be with us here. This is five years out, it's supposed to be like maybe from a few months ago, right? Um, so what are we at? Maybe 3%. Fortunately, we're networked, so it should be a little bit lower than that. Um, okay, so we consider the network model for SAIRS. So we have for each node, we have asymptomatic infected, symptomatic infected, and recovered. Right. Um, what we're going to do in order to sort of look at this in terms of the whole adjacency matrix is we're basically going to stack all of our A sub I, all of our P sub I, and all of our R sub I, right? So we'll get vectors A, P, and R. These will be each of these of dimension N, right? Um, we're gonna take our um, disease parameters, beta, sigma, kappa, gamma, and delta, and we're gonna put them into diagonal matrices, we'll call those B, sigma, K, gamma and D. And we're also going to write diagonal matrices for the A sub I, just so that we can now stack this and write these in matrix vector notation. So these are basically the mean field approximation models, and we've just stacked it and written in matrix vector notation. So the W is the adjacency matrix, the A, P, and R are the um, proportions of uh, or probabilities of infected or recovered. And then all the rest are the um, diagonal matrices of the um, disease parameters. So W is the only non-diagonal thing in there? W is non-diagonal, yeah. But if we assume heterogeneity, the other diagonal matrices are, they're not scalar times identity, right? Only if we assume that all nodes have the same disease parameters. Does that make sense? Uh, they're still diagonal. Just They're diagonal, yeah. Um, okay. So first, if we assume that the adjacency matrix is symmetric, um, then it's not too hard to show using a classic, uh, actually I have my old, for some reason, my old Lyapunov function here, um, a classic Lyapunov approach. This is effectively what we come, but we have to actually start with the R term. Um, so somehow I, I dropped that here. But basically a quadratic Lyapunov function. We can use a quadratic Lyapunov function, and obviously we're going to look at, you know, this is clearly positive, except at, you know, the origin. Um, so we want to look at, you know, under what conditions do we have V dot be negative, right? Classic Lyapunov analysis. Um, and what we can show after uh, doing uh, many um, algebraic manipulations and um, assuming uh, some as I said, we there's there's some work here to eliminate the R val variable and um, 
um, completion of the squares, these types of things, right? Then we can show that uh, a sufficient condition for convergence to the disease-free equilibrium for the network SAIRS model, so COVID, I guess, is that the maximum of this matrix that depends only on the adjacency matrix, essentially, it's got to be upper bounded by the minimum eigenvalue of this matrix that is based on the disease parameters. So a little messier than the SIRS case, but here we have our you know, function of W in comparison to some function of the disease parameter values. And that gives us convergence to the DFE, right? And so in theory, we could use this sort of thing to inform, as I said, say quarantine strategies. We wanna make this lower, right? The sparser we are, the less the uh, interconnections are strong, the smaller that value gets. And here's just a couple, pretty obvious. This looks probably more like what you've seen when you have convergence to the, the, the disease for equilibrium. The difference in rates for uh, the compartment model at top, that's a complete graph or a sparse graph. And, and uh, the axis on the left is different. Okay, um, I'm at 40 minutes. <laughs> I haven't talked about time varying uh, or multi. You want a quick perspective or just skip to the end? Quick perspective and like how much more of the nonlinear analysis tools come into play? Has <laughs> everyone taken that, call, that class? Yeah. So it's this sort of yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me just overview what we did here, and then I can show you just a quick, pl a couple places where we, we use more of the um, chapter four in Khalil, or or um, I think it's actually chapter four also in in Jing's book, the linear time varying <laughs> professor son. Um, okay. So now we're assuming that the adjacency matrix, the edges are time varying. So if we're actually talking about a human contact network, that's clearly true. We're moving around all the time. If we're talking about uh, aggregated population nodes, then this uh, time variation may be due, for example, to traffic patterns or population flow patterns, which may not may be time varying, may actually be periodic, which we haven't taken into account in our analyses that might make things uh, a little bit different. But we're assuming it's um, time varying. Um, my former student, Philip Pare, he, while we were working, he made a bazillion movies of all these various things and put them on YouTube. So if you like watching pictures of dots, <laughs> he's got a, new, a YouTube channel. Um, we largely assume, as I said, that these are heterogeneous infection rates. Okay, so that's the time varying problem. The multivirus multi-layer problem is now we assume that we have multiple viruses or virus strains and they're circulating over possibly multiple um, networks. So here, if we have K virus strains, we might have different networks, K different networks. This is static, these results are static actually, um, but we have different parameters for the different strains and we're allowing heterogeneity among the nodes too. So when we first started doing this back in before COVID, we were thinking, um, you know, this is really like a, a tool for market analysis. You can look at, this is a, I should say also a competing multivirus model. In this particular form, if you're infected with one virus, you can't be infected with the other virus. So we also have some cooperative, it's more complicated, multivirus models. Um, but we were looking at maybe using this for, you know, marketing data or something. Um, you know, so maybe, you know, you have three different products and you have, you know, Facebook, um, Instagram, and TikTok or something people are like posting things about. And um, so based on the different uh, networks that people are communicating across, you know, word of mouth, you know, makes one product become more dominant. So in this case, if it was like a market analysis and you were looking at products, um, obviously you'd want this situation if you were the red product, right? Like, so, so in, in these cases, we're often trying to drive the model to um, the endemic equilibrium that um, favors one product or another. So that was, okay, so, um, so very quickly, um, in the time varying case, 
we can go back to our usual uh, matrix version of our time varying mean field model. We note that um, around the disease free equilibrium, if we're looking at analysis to the disease free equilibrium, this is always going to be upper bounded by this linearized version. So now what do we use? Everyone's taking nonlinear analysis, right? Use the comparison lemon, lemmas, right? Gronwald, Bellman, um, Lyapunov methods. Um, so for the case where the where the um, disease parameters are hom homogeneous and the adjacency matrix is symmetric, we can use basic quadratic Lyapunov function and get global exponential stability. Um, if the disease parameters are heterogeneous, uh, we just need to do a little scaling, but we still get global exponential stability using Lyapunov methods. When we say, okay, we're going to let the graph structure now be uh, non-symmetric, it gets a little more difficult. And so then we have to make a number of additional assumptions on basically the boundedness of the rate of change of this linearized subsystem, right? Um, and so we have to assume this is Hurwitz, right? So the maximum eigenvalue of that linearized system is always negative. Um, and then we have some bounded rate variation conditions. In this case, then, this is where we come in. We use Gronwall's inequality because we're using that linearized subsystem as an upper bound on the nonlinear dynamics. And then we get out Professor Sun's book and look up how to prove LTV stability and just follow that pretty much exactly. And then we can show we have global exponential stability. We could extend that. We have extended that to the multivirus case. That's pretty direct. Static networks. Um, We've even uh, relaxed the condition for the uh, linear system being Hurwitz at all times. And then what we do is we alternatively require basically a time averaged Hurwitz condition. And we can again show that we can get some stability results. This gets a lot messier. Um, and we can also relax um, what we know about the adjacency matrix to say we have some uncertainty on that delta T. So now we have these uh, uncertain uh, nonlinear equations. This is again the SIS case, right? And then if we satisfy these assumptions, you can talk about what these mean. Um, so they're basically, again, boundedness conditions on the rate of change of various uh, quantities in the model. Then we can again show that we um, can converge exponentially to the disease free equilibrium. Right, and this relied on this. Um, again, Gronwall's inequality and um, applying the results, uh, Victor Solo's L LTV results. Um, so I think I should wrap it up here. Um, oh, this is just a picture showing if this is our maximum eigenvalue of our linearized subsystem in green, as long as the time averaged value is negative we can get a stability to the disease-free equilibrium. So this, to some extent, says, okay, sure, we're in the situation with COVID. The parameters tell us we're not meeting the condition for uh, stability to the disease-free equilibrium, right? But we're networked, so maybe if we go into lockdown or whatever, you know, maybe uh, uh, over average we can get below this long enough for this thing to decay away. We obviously haven't done that. The disease is smart too, right? It's been getting increasingly more transmissible, et cetera. Um, there, there is hope. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it might be a while. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I mean, it may just become so mild. That... Okay, and then we have some re results looking at bivirus. So the multivirus cases, we just looked at bivirus conditions and basically what we showed was it's hard to quantify equilibria. It, even going to the bivirus case, and um, I'm really using up time, so I'm trying to go fast. And um, it's hard to control if we want to try to use uh, state feedback. So for the bivirus case uh, or the multivirus case, um, there are a lot of open problems here that are yet to be solved. 
even quantifying the equilibrium, even when we go to just two viruses. Um, I'm not talking about this at all, it's just references. There's a lot of work on um, control of viruses out there, especially optimal resource allocation approaches to um, really vaccine and treatment delivery, um, a lot. And then a lot of the other policy um, studies are there, there isn't quite as much. Um, so um, what are, what's left? As I said, there's um, still a lot of work to do in um, looking at um, uh, control methods for mitigating virus spread, in particular over the time varying networks. Um, we talked about a lot of sufficient stability conditions, no necessary sufficient conditions. It was all sufficient. Um, the analysis of equilibria in the even the bivirus, the multivirus, multilayer case is pretty complicated. Um, we talked about competitive multivirus models. There's some recent work on cooperative, but there's a, a lot of open problems here. Um, control of bivirus, we have an impossibility result for linear control. Obviously, we need to look at more advanced control methods there. Um, and then what Pete asked about, this has been a real problem throughout COVID, right? The data is really, from a real statistical estimation perspective, mostly useless. And we use it anyway, right? Or like I said, some some countries tested everyone. And, but they didn't always test everything to be able to get all the parameters either, right? So um, if we know in the future we're only ever going to have convenient sample data, like we have with COVID, what can we say about estimating parameters? Can we come up with some um, air bounds? Oh, yeah. and that concludes. And I'm sorry, I went so long. Thank you for your patience. Maybe we have time just one question. Yeah. Well, look at the convergence of the stochastic system to the network field system. Yes. So um, I might have it in the references, but starting, I think actually even around 2004, there was a little bit of work, but it really was Van Meegan, I think, who had for the SIS model, and he's recently looked at SEIRS models, I think, um, the showing, proving that the, the Markov model converges to the mean field model, or to the actual exact mean field model, and then we make the approximation. Okay. okay. Yeah. And and for the SAIRS, I should say I had two references there. So that I would say all the heavy work done in that one showing that that um, Markov model converges to the mean field model. That was done by the other reference I had, who's Ashish Hoda and, and his co-authors. Um, it's, it's pretty um, notation intense, et cetera, work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yep. Let's thank Professor Beck again. I'm <laughs> Okay. I have a big question. Uh -huh. So you have beautiful notes. Yeah, in, <laughs> thank you. in terms of stability analysis, is it true that we are actually doing like bifurcation analysis? Because it's more like you are choosing a parameter such that the so the sufficient conditions, uh not really, but if you really want to take into account where you're starting. <laughs> What? Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you really want to take into account, like, where are we starting? What are the initial conditions? Um, and I sort of, it was kind of up there in the SIRS S of zero and even the original Kermack and McKendrick. They looked, uh, and a lot of people looked, there's been a lot of work looking a lot more um, rigorously at um, do you have bifurcations uh, under this initial condition or that initial condition? Okay, but um, but really, if you just you know, so that's like trying to look for tighter conditions. The sufficient condition, it, 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 then you won't have it. it. It covers everything, but you can take into account 
initial conditions and get slightly, you know, it has to be the number that you're looking at is essentially scaled based on some ratios of initial conditions that makes it a little bit smaller. So it's a little easier to meet, but, but there are conditions that will lead to bifurcation. Yeah. Yeah. Is it like a, is it true because bifurcation is easier to serve as a, like a, uh, for like policy decision making or Idea. So what are you saying? If I think mean, I mean, like this kind of global stability analysis and versus like global stability, stability uh -huh, uh -huh. characterization, is it true that people use global stability more? Oh, do they use global or local? Yeah. Um, I think we always try to get global. And in particular, the domain here, of course, for the... Um, Dynamic variables is just the interval zero to one, right? Yeah, it is just a hypercube. Um, and so in in particular respect to that domain, I mean we really try to find global, but um I think when your model if as your models get more complicated or like in particular with the um once you go to like a bivirus model, then it's really hard to get global results. And even with some of the like the time varying yeah, yeah. SIRS, there's some work on that out there. Um, as soon as you know, you just start adding complications to the models, then it gets harder and harder. Unless you have, you know how I posted all those boundedness conditions, so bounded rates of variations, et cetera. You have to make more assumptions to get global. So then, yeah, you'll just get local. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, the other question I had is about from network network model to the mean field model, uh -huh. it feels like if we just assume the just like you say the agenda seems matrix is four of one, then we kind of recover to the mean field. Then you get the compartment model. Uh, the, exactly. So so that's what we call a complete graph. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So those things. So I put those two plots up. So those should be the same. The the. W's all ones should give us the complete, the complete, the compartment model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was curious about like which model is useful in which. Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, so the epidemiologists tend to use the compartment models more. Um, the statistical physicists are involved in this a lot. You probably heard lots of, and, um, and they'll tend to, so it's kind of like where you're coming from, what you like. They'll tend to look at um, sort of the transition between, you know, the statistical models and the compartment models, but they have also started to include networks a lot in their analyses. The so control people like networks. <laughs> but I mean, everyone, like, you know, we're all talking to, I mean, epidemiologists and virologists, immunologists over the last three years. Um, so, um, and, ex and, it, and it really happened with SARS in, I don't know if you remember in 2003, there was SARS in Canada and everyone, like the epidemiologists came out, they used the compartment models. I guess I can turn this off. Um, so it's been slow with grabbing, they use session. But they like the broad Jesse would be with her after that. Yeah. After that. Yeah. Oh, it's something about it's something about the neural system. SIS or SIR. Uh, how this Okay, I use SIS, yeah. Everything is going to explain how this is the Oh, so like if I have a fire.